A round of applause for Alexa, please. Hi, it's, um, it's a real honor to be here today. Um, having spent the last three years witnessing, documenting, and reporting on the secret prosecution of Chelsea Manning, I feel I have a great responsibility to impart to the public the facts and circumstances of her unprecedented trial. Manning was tried by court-martial at Fort Meade, Maryland, home of the NSA, on 22 offenses, including aiding the enemy, espionage, exceeding authorized access, stealing U.S. government property, wanton publication, and failures to obey lawful general regulations. She was later found guilty of 20 of those offenses and sentenced to 35 years in prison. The trial record totals about 45,000 pages, believed to be the longest in U.S. military law. Yet 18 months into the legal proceeding, the public was still forbidden access to more than 30,000 pages of court filings and rulings. During the pretrial, military prosecutors often waived oral arguments in open court or at trial moved the court to conduct its business in closed sessions, further concealing their case from public scrutiny. Military prosecutors even used my website to justify the closure of the test run witness to instruct the court on how it would handle classified testimony at trial. I recently discovered this uh, in the uh, uh, recent documents that were released by the Military District of Washington. By the way, this uh, DSS agent's name is Ronald Rock. <clears throat> on the first day of her trial on the charges, the public did not even have an official copy of Manning's formal plea to 10 lesser included offenses, one of which included different dates than those alleged by military prosecutors at trial. I will explain to you later why this was very important. The failure to allow contemporaneous access to court documents caused irrevocable harm to the public's right to understand and scrutinize the conduct, case law, arguments, and opinions of both trial and defense counsel and the presiding military judge. Even with unofficial transcripts provided to the public by the Freedom of the Press Foundation or myself, most of the critical evidence at trial is still hidden under black redactions or in 200 unreleased court exhibits. For those who apathetically condemn Manning to her fate because she was a low-level soldier in the U.S. military, I remind you that the charge of aiding the enemy is one of two punitive articles under the Uniform Code of Military Justice that applies to any person and not just military personnel. This fact alone is all the more reason the public had a right to access to court documents. While the presiding military judge, Colonel Delise Lind, acquitted Manning of aiding the enemy, for which she faced life in prison, she rejected two defense motions to dismiss the charge altogether. Manning's prosecution for aiding the enemy set a chilling precedent for future whistleblowers and journalists who write about national security issues. According to defense witness Yokai Benkler, Professor Yokai Benkler of the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard Law School, Lynn's failure to dismiss the, enemy, the aiding the enemy charge established a broad legal precedent. When Lynn asked the prosecution if it would have acted the same way had the organization in question been the New York Times and rather than WikiLeaks, the prosecution replied, yes, ma'am. Leaking classified documents to newspapers can by itself be legally sufficient to constitute the offense of aiding the enemy. If the leaker was sophisticated enough about intelligence and how the enemy uses the internet, Bankler said. In other words, all a prosecutor will have to use in any future legal case against a national security whistleblower is that the accused knew the enemy or foreign adversary of the United States used the media organization's platform to collect intelligence. The impact of that not guilty ruling for Manning for aiding the enemy is somewhat negligible because in pronouncing Manning guilty on 20 other accounts, including six Espionage Act offenses and one Computer Fraud and Abuse Act offense, she condemned Manning to 35 years in prison 
And by doing so, she rubber stamped the Obama administration's inquisition of the press and its sources. Lynn ruled that Manning's motive and the lack of actual damage from the disclosures was not relevant at trial. Such evidence then could not be used to mitigate the accusation drawn from the language of the Espionage Act and the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act <clears throat> that Manning had, quote, reason to believe such information could be used to the injury of the United States and to the advantage of any foreign nation. Military prosecutors were only required to prove at trial that the information charged under the Espionage Act was related to the national defense and closely held, meaning it was not already lawfully in the public realm prior to Manning's disclosures, and that the information could cause damage, not that it did cause damage. Military prosecutors called witnesses, they're called original classification authorities at trial from each of the victimized agencies to testify. These witnesses, all of which who were lifelong federal employees or defense contractors, testified that the charged information was properly classified at the time of its release and that its disclosure could cause damage, not that it did cause damage. Manning's civilian defense attorney, David Coombs, argued that the OCAs, the original classification authorities, and their classification reviews failed to cite specific examples within the charged documents that could actually cause damage. Instead, he said they used genera generalities and buzzwords. So again, Manning was convicted on a probable harm standard, uh, not actual harm and she was sentenced to 35 years in prison on expected risk and not actual damage. The fact that most of the charged documents were legally classified and still are legally classified despite a defense request to declassify them for trial prevented Manning's lawyers from citing them openly in court. It also limited the defense's abilities to call witnesses since any potential witness was required to have a security clearance to handle the classified but publicly available information. Although Manning disclosed approximately 725,647 documents, oops, sorry, and that's the breakdown from the four larger data sets, plus 18 documents or approximately 18 documents from smaller releases, which total 725,647 documents. She was only tried and convicted under the Espionage Act language, in other words, the reason to believe such information could be used to the injury of the United States or, to the, or the advantage of any foreign nation for 222 documents from the four larger data sets containing the Iraq and Afghanistan SIGACs, uh, the diplomatic cables, and the Guantanamo detainee assessment briefs, so the Gitmo files. So that plus the 18 documents means Manning was charged in the Espionage Act language for only 240 documents. The OCAs and other government witnesses also testified that enemies and foreign adversaries could use the large data sets to conduct pattern analysis. Yet technically, Manning was charged under this reason to believe language found in the Espionage Act and the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act for only 222 of the four larger data sets. Um, Military prosecutors failed to argue how 222 charged documents could be used for any potential pattern analysis conducted by foreign adversaries or enemies. If military prosecutors wanted to use that argument in court, they should have charged Manning under the Espionage Act and the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act for more than 222 documents. I have a few more carefully chosen words later for anyone, and I don't really care who they are, but especially those journalists public intellectuals and academics who frankly should know better, who either recklessly or pejoratively refer to pub publication of Manning's primary source documents as dumps. This is what a dump is. 
Manning's conviction for the unprecedented offense of wanton publication, which is not tied to any existing punitive article under the Uniform Code of Military Justice or any federal criminal violation, is intended to interdict, interdict the future leak of large data sets capable of being mined or modeled for revelations by digital journalists and organizations like WikiLeaks. When asked by the military prosecutors if mass document leaking is somewhat inconsistent with journalism, Bankler from the Harvard Center for Internet and Society um, said that the large data sets like the Iraq war logs provided insight that cannot be found in one or two documents containing a smoking gun. The Iraq war logs, added Bankler, provided an alternative independent count of casualties based on formal documents that allow for the analysis that was uncorrelated with the analysis that already came with an understanding of its political consequences. I, um, the documents also contain the lives of <laughs> human beings, uh, valuable information about the detainees of America's war on terror the children and the human beings that have been slaughtered by America's wars. And at a symposium on WikiLeaks held at the University of Southern California in 2011, Professor Derek Shearer of Occidental College, who served as ambassador to Finland during the Clinton administration, cited the Tunisian Revolution as a positive outcome from the publication of the diplomatic cables. The revelation of the US government's negative view of dictator uh, Ben Ali is believed to have fueled anger towards the Tunisian regime. Some of this frank speaking, he says, it, of not secrets but just frank descriptions of a country had a positive outcome. But these cables are not the secret level in which the government operates. We have a whole separate system of much more secret reporting that comes to the intelligence officers in the embassies. And then we have a whole other channel, the defense intelligence operations, uh, defense attache reporting. So the notion that some vital secrets of America were compromised by WikiLeaks, I think, is not the case. I spoke to somebody recently at the Washington Post who told me they refer to WikiLeaks publications every single day. And Bankler testified at trial that WikiLeaks was a new mode of journalism that fit the distributed model of engagement, news gathering, and dissemination in the internet age what he termed the networked fourth estate. And if WikiLeaks is part of the networked fourth estate, then so is Manning and the, re and the releases, and the types of releases that she uh, um, executed. The root problem today is not the style of Manning leaks, it's the pervasive propaganda, and it's the control of the media by the few. Jeremy Scahill's book, Dirty Wars, relies heavily on WikiLeaks source documents, which were disclosed by Manning. Dirty Wars is a perfect example of the long-term public benefit of both substance and methodology of Manning's disclosures and WikiLeaks publications. On July 28, 2010, Robert Gates, the Secretary of Defense at the time, directed the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, Ronald Burgess, to establish an information review task force to lead a comprehensive Department of Defense review of classified documents posted to the WikiLeaks website on July 25, 2010, and other associated materials. Gates directed the IRTF to complete a report containing any released information with immediate force protection implications any released information concerning allies or coalition partners that may negatively impact foreign policy, any military plans, any intelligence reporting, any released information concerning intelligence sources and methods, any information on civilian casualties not previously released, any derogatory comments regarding Afghan culture or Islam, any related data that might also have been released to WikiLeaks but not yet posted. The task force led by counterintelligence expert Brigadier General Robert Carr was made up of 80 to 125 people, including intelligence analysts and counterintelligence experts from the DIA, Pacific Command, Central Command, the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, which is responsible for managing the ongoing Department of Defense uh, investigation of WikiLeaks. Other interagency partners included the FBI and the Army Criminal Investigation Command. 
Carr eventually testified for the prosecution during the sentencing portion of Manning's court-martial in a closed session or by classified stipulation. In the summer of 2010, uh, so months before the release of diplomatic cables, the Department of State began working with the IRTF to review any purported state material in the releases and to provide an assessment as well as a summary of the overall effects the WikiLeaks releases would have on relations with host countries. And that's according to the Ambassador, uh, Ambassador Patrick Kennedy, who's the Under Secretary of Management and is a central figure in the WikiLeaks investigation. He's probably the most central of all the public officials in the US government. Um, which of course begs the question, this statement by Patrick Kennedy and the fact of the IRTF review by the State Department in the summer of 2010, followed by the Chiefs of Mission review at the State Department um, that came you know, following that. Why it took the State Department months to shut down the net-centric diplomacy database, um, and they did it with such hysterical fanfare the day after WikiLeaks began publishing Cablegate. If they believed that the threat was an actual, if they believed that the release was an actual threat to national security, I would imagine that they would have shut it down much earlier than that. But more on the State Department later. According to the military prosecutors, the DIA IRTF was specifically stood up and relates to all the charges against Chelsea Manning, for which Manning was found guilty and for which she was acquitted of. The review, they reviewed the Sydney, Afghanistan, and, SIGA, and Iraq SIGAX, the Guantanamo files, CENTCOM videos, um, documents related to a May 2009 U.S. cluster bombing in uh, the Guarani village in the far province of Afghanistan that had mass um, civilian casualties, and diplomatic cables. Um, the diplomatic cables, the Defense Department reviewed them for their impact on uh, Department of Defense military to military relationships and forces. Carr also testified that the IRTF did not review any of the litigation regarding Guantanamo detainees to see if that information was already contained in the WikiLeaks disclosures. So CENTCOM has released a lot of uh, material about detainees through FOIA requests and habeas cases. So the, the IRTF never checked whether or not there was this information was already in the public realm. Uh, in the summer of 2010, Gates wrote a letter to the chair of the Senate Armed Services Committee, Senator Carl Levin, stating that the initial assessment of the IRTF in no way discounted the risk to national security. However, the review to date has not revealed any sources and methods compromised by this exposure. The final DIA IRTF report is 100 pages. It's classified. It has not been released. John Kirchhofer, who was the deputy in charge of the DIA IRTF, testified regarding the DIA damage assessment as follows. We did not use the term damage. We were very careful. That's a statutory authority within the ONSEX, this office of the National Counterintelligence Executive. We were just trying to look at the impact on DOD. Brigadier General Robert Carr, the counterintelligence expert, who directed the DIA IRTF, who was appointed by Burgess, is currently corporate lead executive for Northrop Grumman's business in the Fort Meade and Aberdeen, Maryland area. Despite Carr having testified that the impact of the disclosure continued to this day, so he said that the impact was continuing, he also testified that no assessment has ever been made to quantify the impact of the disclosures on, for example, cooperation between Iraqi or Afghanistan Stani nationals and, and U.S. service members, of military personnel. Carr testified that the disclosures did not contain direct references to human or human intelligence sources. The Afghan SIGAX, Carr testified, contained around 900 names, but Carr also testified that many of those names were of people who were already dead or had died at some point on the battlefield. Uh, William Arkin uh, from the Washington Post was recently at the DIA and he tweeted that uh, the damage assessment for the IRTF, uh, which was um, hyped up in the press for years and years, um, now that Manning's uh, been convicted to 35 years, it's, it's revealed that it was low to moderate. Today, we at least know the titles of approximately 238 
of the 240 charged documents under the Espionage Act. And the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act has that Espionage Act clause, reason to believe, come to the injury of the United States. So when I say Espionage Act offenses, I'm referring to both. Uh, Manning was charged under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act for all the State Department material. And then everything else that was related to the U.S. military was under the Espionage Act. Um, they were stealing U.S. government property stuff, but oh, that's, I don't want to complicate the issue. Um, we do not know the names of two of the Guantanamo uh, files. So two of the five Guantanamo files we do not know the names of. Um, Ten or eleven of the 101 charged SIGACs uh, from Iraq and Afghanistan we do not know the name of. Military prosecutors failed to actually provide defense with the identity of 10 of the 101 SIGACs charged against Manning, despite multiple defense requests for them to do so. Why do I say the identity of 10 or 11 SIGACs uh, are still unknown? Because an unclassified declaration of the classification review for the SIGACs has a duplicate name in one of the entries. Um, so that's why I say 10 or 11. It's unclear. We know the actual substance of 198 charged documents out of the 240 because they are published on the internet. 76 of the 101 SIGACs from Iraq and Afghanistan we can actually view on the internet. 116 diplomatic cables, so all the diplomatic cables charged, other than Reykjavik 13, because um, Manning pled to a lesser included offense and the government accepted it, so that, that's not espionage. So the 116 cables from the 251,000, roughly, uh, from the Netcentric Diplomacy database. Three of the five Gitmo file that were charged in the Espionage Act, we know. Um, we know about the 2008 USASIC memo against WikiLeaks, and we know about the two CIA red cell memos. So we have the titles, but do not have access to copies of 24 of the 101 SIG acts charged against Manning. That means that I couldn't find them on WikiLeaks, as far as I can tell. Approximately 15 to 18 CENTCOM documents, official documents, pertaining to mass casualties from a May 4th, 2009 U.S. cluster bombing in the far province of Afghanistan were also never published by WikiLeaks. So let's talk about the SIGAX. There are 101 that are charged against Manning. They're all classified as secret. 62 of them, so 62 of the 101 charged under the Espionage Act, have information that was already in the public realm at the time of its disclosure. Before deploying to Iraq, Manning had worked on worldwide intelligence briefs for the commander of the 2nd Brigade Combat Team at Fort Drum in upstate New York, home of the 10th Mountain Division of the U.S. Army. The 2nd Brigade formed part of the Army's Global Response Force, on call in case troop surges were needed anywhere in the world. In the Garrison Intelligence Shop, Atkins, Manning's commanding officer, tasked Manning with rebuilding the incident tracker. This required Manning to back up hundreds of thousands of military field reports called Significant Activity, or SIGACs, from the wars in Afghanistan, where the 2nd Brigade was expected to deploy. After Manning's unit was reassigned to forward operating base Hammer in eastern Baghdad, she followed suit and created another backup of SIGACs from the wars in Iraq. The backups were made on read-writable CDs, and stored in the intelligence shop's shared conference room at Fobhammer. Analysts could access the backups during periodic interruptions to network connectivity that occurred during deployment. SIGACs are normally housed on US Central Command's database called the Combined Information Data Network Exchange, or SIDNI, which is accessible on a Department of Defense classified network called CIPRNET. CIPRNET contained information classified up to the level of secret. Almost all the information the military presents to the White House and to Congress about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan originates in the Sydney database. Thousands of military personnel, government employees, and federal contractors have access to Sydney's various types of reporting, including human intelligence reports or human as well as SIGACs. Manning disclosed 483,563 SIGACs from the Sydney, Iraq, 
and the Sydney Afghanistan databases. WikiLeaks later published the material as the Iraq War Logs and the Afghan War Diary. Manning did not, however, disclose the other kinds of reporting from the Sydney database, like human or human intelligence, which contained actual intelligence sources and methods. The SIGACs that Manning disclosed military prosecutors admitted at trial only represented 24% of Sydney. Manning told Lynn that she believed that the classification determination of the SIGACs, most of which were marked secret, was based primarily on their being housed on Cipernet. While she knew that the reports were sensitive at the time of their creation, she told the court that she believed that their sensitivity decreased within 48 to 72 hours, as the information was either publicly released or the unit involved was no longer in the area and under threat. Manning regularly researched and reviewed the ground level accounts of events in Iraq and Afghanistan during her long shifts at Fobhammer, and she became deeply troubled by them. The SIG acts that Manning uploaded to WikiLeaks are filled with references to the ubiquity and seeming triviality of death in wartime Iraq. At her trial, Manning said that she released the SIG acts because she believed that a detailed analysis of data over a long period of time by different sectors of society might cause society to reevaluate the, the need or even the desire to engage in counterterrorism and counterinsurgency operations that ignore the complex dynamics of people living in the affected environment each day. She further testified, in attempting to conduct counterterrorism or CT and counterinsurgency coin operations, we became obsessed with capturing and killing human targets on lists and not being suspicious of and avoiding cooperation with our host nation partners and ignoring, ignoring the second and third order effects of accomplishing short-term goals and missions. I believe that if the general public, especially the American public, had access to the information contained within Sydney, Iraq, and Sydney, Afghanistan, it, this could spark a domestic debate on the role of the military and our foreign policy in general as it related to Iraq and Afghanistan. Manning removed the read-writable CD backups from the conference room. In her containerized housing unit, she transferred the files to an SD card and transported them home on her mid-tour leave. Prior to uploading the material to WikiLeaks, she called the Washington Post. She spoke with a reporter who expressed skepticism about Manning, Manning's claims and said she would have to check with the Post's senior editors. Manning then called the telephone number for the public editor at the New York Times and, was le and left a voicemail. Um, I actually just found out who had, like, which, which position at the Washington Post actually got the call from, from Manning. But um, uh, in all, Manning downloaded documents between February and April in 2010 and uploaded them to WikiLeaks at various times in the same period, both during her mid-tour leave and while at Fob Hanum. Okay. The titles of 37 SIG acts are contained in an unclassified declaration concerning the unreleased classification review. Those 37 SIG acts charged against Manning cover a period from October 2006 to November 2009. The identity of 32 of the charged Afghan SIG acts are available on the internet. Most of them, at least 15 of them, concern IED explosions for the years 2008 and 2009. Incidentally, 20 of the SIG acts charged against Manning for Iraq also concern IED explosions. It's probably the largest category of the 101 where we have access to 90 of the SIG acts, the names, and I know where they are. Um, so 20 of those uh, pertain to IEDs. Adam Classfield with Courthouse News, who covered Manning's trial, has written that allegations of expected damage from government officials during sentencing portion of Manning's trial do not correlate to the public data around IEDs. Classfield writes, overall, these numbers reflect a steady decline in the last few years in the number of US fatalities resulting from IED attacks in the aftermath of the leak. Uh, though injuries rose slightly in 2011, they dropped to nearly half a year later. One of the more interesting uh, of the 101 SIG acts, and after you've just listened to me go through the uh, IRTF, you, you, this is your reward, um, <laughs> charged against Manning under the Espionage Act, concerns the kidnapping 
of a U.S. Army soldier, Bo Bergdahl, from Utah, from, from Idaho. Um, Bergdahl is allegedly still in the custody of his captors. So one of the SIG acts, of the 101 SIG, SIG acts, concerned the kidnapping of a U.S. soldier who is still in custody. His family said that they received a letter from him this summer, actually during Manning's trial. Manning wasn't mentioned in the article. I mean, it's two separate issues, but um, uh, nevertheless, that, that's what happened. According to a report a year earlier by the late Michael Hastings uh, in a Rolling Stone magazine, Bergdahl became a pawn in the Pentagon's negotiations to end the war in Afghanistan. In Bergdahl's last email home to his parents before he was captured, he wrote the following. The future is too good to waste on lies, and life is way too short to care for the damnation of others, as well to spend it helping fools with their ideas that are wrong. I have seen their ideas, and I am ashamed to be an American. The honor of the self-righteous arrogance that they thrive on, it is all revolting. His email continues. In the US Army, you are cut down for being honest. But if you are, conceited, if you are a conceited, brown-nosing shitbag, you will be allowed to do whatever you want, and you will be handled, handed your higher rank. The system is just wrong. I am ashamed to be an American, and the title of US soldier is just the lie of fools. The US Army is the biggest joke in the world, and the world has to laugh at it. It is an army of liars, backstabbers, fools, and bullies. The few good sergeants are getting out as soon as they can, and they are telling us privates to do the same. These people need help, yet what they get is the most conceited country in the world telling them that they are nothing and that they are stupid and that they have no idea how to live. Hastings writes that Bergdahl's parents believe that their son's witnessing of an Afghan child being run over by a mine-resistant ambush patrol vehicle is what might have caused uh, their son to snap and desert the U.S. Army before being captured in Afghanistan. Um, we, don't we don't even care when we hear, this is, he's writing home to his parents, we don't even care when we hear each other talk about running their children down in the dirt with our armored trucks, Bergdahl wrote. We make fun of them in front of their faces and laugh at them for not understanding. We are insulting them. Bergdahl responded to his son's last email message before he deserted and then was captured with the subject line entitled, Obey Your Conscience. Dear Bo, his dad wrote, in matters of life and death, and especially of war, it is never safe to ignore one's conscience. Ethics demands obedience to our conscience. It is best to have a systematic oral defense of what our conscience demands. Stand with like-minded men when possible. Hastings concludes in his article about this, this particular soldier, ordinary soldiers, especially raw recruits, face comment for the first time and respond to the horror in all sorts of ways. Some take their own lives. After years of seemingly endless wars and replete deployments, active duty soldiers in the US Army are currently committing suicide at a rate of 25% uh, higher than the regular population, the civilian population. Other soldiers lash, lash out with unauthorized acts of violence. The staff sergeant charged with murdering 17 Afghan civilians in their homes last March. Um, uh, the notorious kill team of US soldiers who went on a shooting spree in 2010, murdering civilians for sport and taking part in the, uh, uh, the corpses for trophies. Many come home permanently traumatized, unable to block out the nightmares. Bo Bergdahl, Hastings Wright, had a different response. He just walked away. And Manning had a different response as well. Panetta and Hillary, uh, one senior official told Hastings, don't give a shit about Bo Bergdahl. They want to be able to say that, co that they coined their way out of Afghanistan or whatever, so it doesn't look like they're cutting and running. We, the public, are still waiting for the military district of Washington to release the court-ordered, unclassified and redacted, quote, expedited, unquote, transcripts of the closed sessions. A similar problem arises when military prosecutors and their witnesses argue at trial and during the sentencing phase that the information Manning disclosed could potentially be used in future propaganda efforts by the enemies of the United States. Elizabeth Gautin of the Brennan Center for Justice at New York Law School 
has written that the absence of a limiting principle to the U.S. government's <clears throat> expanding justification for classification and its prosecution of whistleblowers who disclose it is alarming. The government's new justification for secrecy, she writes, will be strongest when its conduct most clearly violates accepted international norms. <clears throat> so the diplomatic cables is the second largest data set. I should sort of clarify something. The SIGAX and the, uh, the SIGAX are sort of counted together. They're two different data sets. So the, the State Department cables would be the third data set, and then the fourth one would be the Guantanamo files. This database contained 251,287 documents. For the complete disclosure, from the complete disclosure, 130,000 of those documents were unclassified. 100,000 of them were labeled confidential. And then 15,000 were classified as secret. None of the documents were top secret. Manning was charged under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act for 116 cables. When the State Department initially gave the cables to military prosecutors, the prosecution had to go back to the State Department and ask them to please give them more because they needed more for the court martial. So they provided, I believe the number, and I have to double check on this, but I think it was somewhere between 50 and 75 diplomatic cables to the military prosecutors and said, okay, you know, try him on the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act for these. And the military prosecutors are like, we need more. So um, that sort of tells you where that was at. When the State Department initially gave them those cables, um, sorry, the number of individuals actually moved by the WikiLeaks Persons at Risk group is actually classified, that number. But the number ranges somewhere between 20 and 30 people. Firstly, the State Department was aware for months that WikiLeaks was in possession of the cables from the Netcentric Diplomacy database. WikiLeaks offered the State Department to privately elect, quote, specific instances, record numbers or names, where it considered the publication of information would put di uh, individuals, uh, persons at significant risk of harm that has already not been addressed. The State Department legal advisor, Harold Coe, responded with a letter stating that the diplomatic cables were provided in violation of US law, and as long as WikiLeaks was holding such material, the violation is ongoing. The letter, as many of you may know, is the basis for the suspension of service by PayPal uh, and, and other American service providers. The former vice president of PayPal, Osama Bader, said on December 8, 2010, that PayPal's decision to suspend service to WikiLeaks was a result of Coe's letter um, to Assange. Bader described the letter as stating that WikiLeaks activities were deemed illegal by the United States. In September 2011, the AP conducted an unofficial review of the State Department cables published by WikiLeaks. The AP found several of them comfortable with their names out in the open, and no one fearing death. Others already dead, their names cited as sensitive in the context of long, long resolved conflicts or situations. Some have publicly written or testified at hearings about the supposedly confidential information that they provided to the US government. The AP also reported that the total damage appeared limited and that the State Department had steadfastly refused to describe any situation in which they felt a source's, li a source's life was at danger. Some have public, oh, sorry, they said a handful of people had to be relocated away from danger, but won't provide any details on who those few cases are. One cable charged against Manning uh, under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is entitled 07 Kingston Jamaica Malaria Update. So these are the kinds of documents that ultimately put Manning away for 35 years in prison. This, uh, this one, this is, relates to this, this cable, but this particular cable uh, has left a lot of commentators very confused as to the national defense uh, matter or how it was useful to the enemy. When I asked national security commentator Marcy Wheeler about the Kingston cable, she noted that an October 2007 update on the outbreak of malaria in Jamaica was removed from the Center for Disease Control's website on January 14, 2011. 
around the time the diplomatic cables were being published by WikiLeaks. Wheeler speculates that the cable might have been charged against Manning because military prosecutors wanted to argue that it gives a roadmap for how a country would respond to an act of bioterrorism. <laughs> military prosecutors called witnesses to testify that the leaks affected diplomatic reporting and relationships with foreign governments. Manning's defense maintained that any impact on bilateral relations was short-term and temporary. Reuters reported that government reviews of the release of diplomatic cables caused only, quote, limited damage to US interests abroad, despite the Obama administration's public statements to the contrary, unquote. A congressional aide briefed by the State Department was quoted saying the revelations were, quote, embarrassing but not damaging, unquote. The quote continues, Obama administration felt compelled to say publicly that the revelations had seriously damaged American interests in order to bolster legal efforts to shut down WikiLeaks website and to bring charges against the leakers. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the Guantanamo files. The worst of the worst, I mean, um, um, the brilliant American intelligence leaked out onto the internet. I don't know what we're going to do, but, um, <laughs> The South, the Southcom database contains 779 detainee assessment uh, briefs called the Gitmo files. The, the, but they're memoranda um, from the JTF Gitmo. Um, and Manning was charged under the Espionage Act for five of them. So out of the 779. We know that three of them are the Tipton Three, which are, th there are three British citizens from Tipton, England, who were held at Guantanamo for two years uh, and then released without trial or charges. They are Shafiq Razul, uh, Ruel Ahmed, and Asif Iqbal. Some of you may remember how a former Gitmo guard and Iraq vet uh, named Brandon Neely uh, flew to the UK in January 2010 to make amends to Ahmed and Razul. Um, some of you may also remember um, that uh, they've made films, of anti-Guantanamo Bay documentaries. Well, the US government considers all three of them terrorist recidivists uh, because they are former uh, detainees involved in anti-American propaganda or criticism. So now we go to the FARA documents. We don't have access to these documents. They were never published, but they, they all concern the mass casualties and the US government and, and the military's policy for dealing with those mass, mass casualties that related from three strikes. This one, these documents pertain specifically to the Guarani airstrike, which is separate from the charge related to the Guarani airstrike video, which Manning was found not guilty of. We know their names, and um, it's interesting because just September uh, 2013, two months ago, the Nation published an article about some of these documents that had been released after Manning was convicted. And the rationale, so all of these documents that Manning released here will show you, according to this Nation article, although they don't really tie it to Manning, exactly why the US government established the two fragos and how this frago, these two fragos were causing major um, divisions within the military because um, people weren't following them and they weren't stopping the uh, hemorrhaging of, of mass casualties by U.S. cluster bombing in Afghanistan at the time. So there's a rationale to this leak for Manning. Um, I want to talk to you about the Guarani airstrike. This is, these documents relate, this is a, a burn victim from the Guarani airstrike. <clears throat> So these doc, these, this picture relates both the Guarani airstrike video, which Manning was found not guilty of, and then the documents which she was found guilty of. The interesting thing about the Guarani airstrike is that the government wanted to allege that Manning had disclosed it uh, in, uh, basically in November, trying to push the date as close to the time that Manning arrived in Iraq. Remember when I talked about earlier that Manning pled to different dates? A major part of the drama of the trial was the fact that Manning said, no, I leaked these documents and the videos in April. The reason why government prosecutors, they didn't have the forensic evidence and Manning was found not guilty, 
is because the Guarani airstrike video ties to the U.S. grand jury investigating WikiLeaks and seven civilians uh, that is, is, is continuing today. So I just want to quickly go through. Um, actually, the grand jury started before many people allege and the press alleges. It was actually up and operational in September 2010, as this email that was recently released <clears throat> by military prosecutors uh, details. And um, the, you know, the Eastern District of Virginia is commonly understood to be, uh, and, and is, in fact, uh, responsible for the grand jury impaneled there investigating civilians, including Julian Assange and the founders, owners, managers of WikiLeaks. But the investigation also goes into the Southern District of New York. And this document that was recently released uh, details. These um, attachments, we don't have the attachments. And if you see the whole document, it's just black completely blacked out, but these are actually more seal orders for other EC electronic communication orders, if you look under attachments, that relate to the grand jury. So, you know, the Twitter is an EC, Twitter 2703D, you know, Jacob Babam, Brigitte, John Stoddard, the, these are more of them. And here are some more, and some search warrants, too. Um, this is the uh, classified Weirdly enough, the Manning Lamo chat logs are actually classified, if you can actually believe it. So one thing that we, we don't have access to in the court, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to say that, you know, Manning is confined at the U.S. disciplinary barracks at Fort Leavenworth in Kansas. Her case must be reviewed and approved by the convening authority, Major General Jeffrey Buchanan. This process is referred to as taking the action on a case. Buchanan has the power to disapprove any conviction and or to reduce Manning's sentence. Once Buchanan takes action, the case will be automatically re uh, reviewed by the Army Court of Criminal Appeals. Such a review by ACCA could take years. Manning's defense attorney has filed an application seeking a presidential pardon from President Obama. Coombs says it is unlikely that the request will be granted. Uh, Obama has only granted nine pardon requests during his presidency, and he has never granted a pardon for someone who he has previously said was guilty. I wanted to say something else just about the grand jury. The National Security Division of the Department of Justice is responsible with EDVA, the Eastern District of Virginia, for the WikiLeaks grand jury. <clears throat> now, why that's important to know is that in order to decline a prosecution, once you've established an investigation, that is of a national security uh, is categorized as a national security investigation, and it, that it is in the National Security Division in and of itself is, shows that it's a national security investigation, <coughs> requires the approval of the Assistant uh, Attorney General of the National Security Division, the counter espionage section, or higher ups. So when you see this, you know, stuff going on in the press about the grand jury and, you know, this is a very serious matter. This is not a joke here. Uh, there, there are real forces at play in the United States, and it's an interagency investigation. It is being, uh, it's been a coordinated partnership between the Department of State, the Department of Justice, and the Department of Defense, the CIA, the NSA, uh, on six, and other government agencies. It is the largest criminal investigation ever conducted into a publisher and its source. <clears throat> it presents a, a tremendous danger to uh, democracy and the rule of law, that it's being allowed to continue, and that members of the press and the public are in this like gossip uh, fest about it. I mean, this is a serious criminal investigation. Uh, and, you know, the U.S. government considers WikiLeaks to be a national security threat. <clears throat> James Clapper, the director of national intelligence, said so in front of two high-level Senate intelligence and armed services committees. So. I just wanted to end with saying that I think that Manning's story is fundamentally like the greatest war story of our generation. It's our all quiet on the Western Front. I am young, I am 20 years old, yet I know nothing of life but despair, death, fear, and fatuous superficiality cast over an abyss of sorrow. I see how peoples are set against one another and in silence, unknowingly, foolishly, obediently, innocently slay one another. It is our thin red line. Maybe all men got one big soul, everybody's a part of it. All faces are the same man. And it is our catch-22. It was miraculous. 
It was almost no trick at all. He saw, turned vice into virtue, and slander into truth, impotence into abstinence, arrogance into humility, plunder into philanthropy, thievery into honor, arrogance into humility, uh, sorry, blasphemy into wisdom, <laughs> brutality into patriotism, and sadism into justice. Anybody could do it. It, is, it required no brains at all. It required merely no character. And Bradley Manning, I'm sorry, Chelsea Manning, is story is actually also our trial. This is a entry into a multi-page document uh, concerning her behavior every two minutes at the Quantico Brig. So I'll end with that. Thank you. Thank you. We now have eight minutes for Q&A, so if you have a question, there are four mics, one, two there, and two there, and you can also go on the ISC or um, probably on Twitter. So we'll just go ahead and start with you, number one. Hello. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you for being at the Manning trial when other journalists weren't. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about the closed session part of the trial. Do you think um, there was stuff talked about that we don't know about, like um, things that weren't leaked yet? Or was it just the usual ridiculous secrecy around this? It's, I, I, I suspect it's the unusual, the usual secrecy around this that, you know, is pretty par and, part and parcel with the U.S. government right now. Uh, defense uh, has said that nothing was said in the session that um, caused them any alarm, that it was all just generalities and buzzwords, like IED explosions, but they never really talked about how it actually caused damage. Number two, please. So, uh, hi, thanks for your talk, this is really great. And thanks for the work that you're doing. You're the only journalist in the whole world that's actually covering this in depth. Um, I had one, one correction and one question. Okay. So the correction is that <clears throat> WikiLeaks is not a national security threat. We're a national security promise. <laughs> <laughs> and second of all, um, I think that it would be really useful to try to organize a lot of FOIA Privacy Act requests and there are a lot of people whose lives have been destroyed by this grand jury. Uh, I've been targeted by it, uh, like 10 people in this audience that I've seen, I'm pretty sure we're also targeted by it. So is there a way that we can work with you to uh, try to get as many documents as we possibly can to show the sort of neo-McCarthyist crackdown on WikiLeaks and people who care about these topics? I have about 200 FOIAs out right now, and I'm actually going to be suing the government next week, but I don't want to announce what I'm suing them over. So yes, there is something that's going on. I mean, the important thing with this is also to kind of d lay down low. Like, I'm pretty, I know the documents for the Manning trial, and I'm going to get everything out of the government that I can, and I'm going to, I have an attorney to help me do that, so. So should we approach you um, to like sign Privacy Act waivers yes, or things like that? Yes, exactly. So if you want your information sought and you believe that you're related to this, and we can talk about it privately, um, I will give you documents that I need to get in order to get files from you, files about you from government agencies. So um, you can find me on Twitter at carwinb.net and we can move from there somewhere else. Or come up to me while I'm here. Thank you. Okay, we have questions from the internet. Yes, there are two questions on IRC. The first one is, um, how does the Manning case inform us about what might happen to Snowden? Well, uh, I think that um, Snowden has said himself that he was inspired by Manning, but also um, uh, learned from Manning. I think what's important here, though, is to come back to this idea, you know, of Manning as the victim, or poor Manning's away in prison. Man we're going to get Manning out of prison. <laughs> you know, that is how I feel about it. We're going to get Manning out of prison because it is an abomination that Manning is in prison. <laughs> and part of that is characterizing her leaks 
and WikiLeaks publications in an accurate light. Um, and, and defending a freedom of the press. Freedom of the press, I mean, it costs nothing to publish today on the internet, and there's a power in that, and not letting that be taken away because we think we have to rely on a billionaire in order to uh, publish useful information. It uh, has a great public be benefit. Anyway. One more from the internet, please. Yes. Um the question is, uh, can you tell us if Chelsea Manning gets mails, books, and all the other stuff being sent to her, and does she care about it? Well, from what I'm, I, I don't, you know, I don't speak for Manning, um, but from what her defense attorney tells me and from people around her, uh, the, the private Manning support network and Nathan Fuller and people like that, um, she actually really enjoys the mail that she receives. Um, and um, has, I know of that she has a couple of very robust uh, pen pal ships with very strong public intellectuals who are also very protective of her, and I'm very happy for her that she has that. Are you number three? Are you, is this a question? Okay, go ahead. Hello. Um, uh, thank you for this amount of information. There's a lot to process. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm, I was wondering the whole time about um, what's happening on the American street after Snowden and after Manning, because actually we don't get a lot if something is changing. And I would be cu curious also to know um, whether there is some um, movement on the street. So, uh, I mean, if things um, happen, like um, what happened to Manning, and people still relate to that kind of political systems and to the, this kind of institution, then there is actually a need to change that. And uh, my question is, is there a slight change on the American street or is that a long shot? I, the way I look at Manning's leaks and the power of Manning's leaks, the, why, the reason why I'm very protective of her personally is she leaked documents about people who don't have a vote, who are victims of America's wars who are faceless and nameless and nothings. And to me, that is the power of that publication. So does the Amer is American conscious of uh, Manning's leaks? Weirdly enough, I mean, I think that the Hollywood movies have sort of come sideways and, and influenced people. They're aware of Manning in the context of a Hollywood narrative. Uh, I don't know if they're aware of the spirit of her leaks and her actions. I, I can't say. Okay. Thank okay, you. thank you. We are out of time. So please give Alex another round of applause.